Hey guys, DM here, and today we are talking about something very interesting because normally I'm talking to you about how to buy properties, furnish them and rent them, and then retire early off the rental income. But today we're gonna talk about why I chose to sell a property that was actually generating $3,000 a month in pure cash flow above the mortgage and expenses. I'm also gonna share with you from the $100,000 gain in price value that we got, what did we actually get to keep? Because of course there's commissions and taxes and some hidden fees. Then I'm gonna tell you from the profits what I chose to do with that money and how I'll be reinvesting the original nest egg that we got back. Be sure to stay to the end of the video because I'm gonna share with you a loophole that I found and it saved me almost $30,000 by bypassing the California state withholding of the sales price. So stay tuned. All right, guys, so let's talk about why I chose to sell this property. So this is a home that is in my local area and we bought it for $800,000. At the time, we chose to put 25% down, which was $200,000. The reason why we chose to put that high of a percentage down against my normal standard of operation was because we were anticipating that we were gonna retire my husband much sooner than we actually ended up doing it. So what we really wanted was big cash flow and that's why we put that down now this was a few houses ago so i wasn't as savvy as i am now about return on investments and low down payments this was actually the biggest down payment we've ever put down by far and i don't recommend it even in that scenario now looking back right so with the two hundred thousand dollar down we also requested a seller closing credit which they did give us so they gave us $15,500 as a closing credit. We didn't have to pay for any closing costs. We were able to reduce the um, interest rate that we were scheduled to have because we had extra money to buy the rate down, which wasn't even our money. It was part of the closing cost. And with expenses and cleaning fees, the units actually profited about $3,000 a month this home was divided up into a way where the upstairs was rented up separately and the downstairs was rented out separately as two different units. It sounds like a dream, right? $3,000 a month, but we kind of ran into a lot of headaches with this property. First of all, it was located at a narrowing area of a driveway down into a court. So the parking situation, we had to at least allow the upstairs to have two cars because it was a two bed, two bathroom home. And the downstairs, which was a studio, we had to at least allow one car, which meant that we had to park one car on the street. There wasn't really a lot of curb parking. So the neighbors were also a little bit of sticklers about it. In retrospect, when purchasing the next property, I wanna make sure that parking won't be an issue. Like for example, that there's not a fire hydrant in front of the curb in front of your house, or there's not a community mailbox in front of the curb in front of your house, or red zone or things like that. Keep that in mind when you're looking for a property. We thought that it would work and ultimately it did work out just fine, but not without some discomfort or feeling like we're infringing on the neighborhood's ambiance and residential vibe you know in addition to the parking being an issue we also experienced our first major appliances breaking down so our water heater broke down during the course of guest stays and then we had a separate experience where the furnace was breaking in the winter time during guest stays so experiencing vacancies and going through an insurance claim I can do a video about that later that was a very interesting and learning filled experience on how to do insurance claims and get your money back. Between all of that, I was starting to feel like this property is a little bit of an aggravation. And it was, although providing $3,000 of cash flow a month, the return on investment as a percentage of the cash on cash return, $3,000 times 12 months in a year, divided by $200,000 of an investment was a very low return on investment compared to the houses that we were also getting to $3,000 return on investment per month, except that we put a down payment of five or 10% plus renovation costs or whatever, it actually turned out to be one of our lowest percentage ROI out of 
everything in our portfolio. I thought to myself, okay, we have um, since then purchased two other properties that are doing well and have really rocking ROIs. And so I'm like, let me get this money back and do something else with it because I think I can stretch my money further. Plus, we were at the peak of the market. So we bought this house at $800,000. At the time of the sale, I was gonna be able to get $900,000, I think, I wasn't sure. So I was like, okay, $100,000 profit minus all of the um, commission taxes. We should be able to walk away with 70 something thousand dollars. That feels good. I can use that money towards something else and then I can reinvest the original nest egg $200,000. Based on that, that's what we did. Okay, now let's get into the numbers. As you know, we bought the property at $800,000, put 25% down, which is $200,000, got $15,500 as a closing cost credit, so we didn't have to pay any costs for closing. And now I can see that the market price has gone up. I was actually considering to sell around $850, $875, but I realized after paying commissions and taxes and all sorts of things that come along with that that we weren't gonna take home enough profit to make the work of buying it and furnishing and fixing it up and managing it all this time really worth it for me but then it got to 900,000 said Zillow so we went ahead and we listed it I think at like 910 or something like that and it sat for a little while we I think we dropped it 10k after a couple weeks and then towards the end of almost a month we dropped it to 890 lucky for us there was a couple who was looking at it and they had gone back multiple times to look at it while another family they had bumped into those multiple times, which meant to them that, oh, there's actually a competitor here who's interested in buying this home. So they offered us 10,000 more to make sure that they secured the deal. So we were really lucky and we actually sold for 900,000. With the 900,000 minus the 800,000 of the original purchase price, that leaves us with $100,000 gain. But from that $100,000, you can see that we have various expenses that we needed to finalize payoff, including commissions, et cetera, closing costs. We were gonna end up with $74,831, approximately. I say approximately because I'm showing you the, these numbers, but I don't know if that was actually the finalized one. If I, it, it wasn't, it was off by like a few thousand dollars or a few hundred dollars, so it's not a big deal. You get the point. Of that $74,000, what would normally happen is when you make a sale in the state of California, California will automatically withhold 3.33% of the gross sales price off of what you would take home. So in my case, it would have been $29,970, practically $30,000 slashed right off the top. So I would have only been able to take home 44 ish thousand dollars. And what's crazy about that is the year before or a couple years before, I had also sold a property to reinvest in another property. They did the same thing, except that they didn't give me credit for that. So by the time the end of the year came around and I filed for my taxes and they denied that I ever paid that amount already. So we had to petition it and wait and it took almost like another year because during COVID everything was so slow and crazy that I'm like, oh heck no, I'm not giving you another $30,000 to keep and then maybe give me credit or not credit and then I have to petition. Meanwhile, that money could be earning me interest, right? So I researched and I found a way to bypass that. So stay tuned and at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you the form that I use, how I did that and how I was able to keep my entire 74-ish thousand dollars. Okay, so what did we do with the $74,000 that we got? Well, we were able to pay off our wedding completely. We had a wedding in Cancun, Mexico. We had 49 guests, including ourselves there. It was a lovely celebration and it was such a good feeling to be able to come out of that with no debt and just totally paid it off in cash. Then we were able to pay for our one month long honeymoon traveling Europe that was like 15 or $20,000. I still have to do the math on all of the 
bookkeeping for that, but it was a significant amount of money. I never spend that much traveling. So it was just so nice and guilt free to be able to go do that um, once in a lifetime experience completely paid for. Jake is retired now for, a, uh, what is it, approaching a year. And so our plan for our life is that for the next year and a half, we're gonna be continuing to travel all through the world, Asia, Australia, Africa, more of Europe, etc. And so the rest of the money will be used towards flights and hotel stays, and then our regular monthly allowance can pay for our spending habits while we are in those destinations. That's what that money was for. And I'm so grateful. It was just complete permission to live our best life. You know, Jake lost his parents and, um, they were on the cusp of retirement and didn't really enjoy pretty much a single day of their retirement and that's not the life that he ever wants to live he is so like free-spirited and he just wants to be happy and my job in our relationship is to find ways to fund that and his job is to plan all of these events i mean like he planned all of europe but anyway i digress the whole point of that is to say that you do all these things to make money and you need to also give yourself permission to spend it if you have a plan to continue to stabilize yourself financially going forward. So let's roll into that and talk about how um, we plan to spend that $200,000 original nest egg. All right, guys, so now we have this money back and what are we going to do? I do feel a little bit of anxiety about figuring out what the best next move is. I don't want to do us wrong. I don't want to have pulled that money out from an already cash flowing investment to make a worse decision. So everything I do next has to be really smart. Um, my game plan is I really want to get into the multifamily game. And here's why. If you do five units or more, if you purchase a multifamily unit, that is five or more, the process of evaluating the market price of the home is different than a four unit or less down to a single family home. When you're looking at those smaller ones, it's based on comps. So when you go to buy a house, the value of the house is based on the surrounding homes that have recently sold and what their values are as opposed to the larger multifamilies, it's based on the performance of the actual unit as an investment. So if you're able to increase rents and increase the profitability of that unit, then you're able to now have a higher market value for reselling purposes or refinancing purposes to get some money cash back out and to reinvest in other properties. I think building wealth is more aggressive and faster this way, but it's a big learning curve for me because we don't own any multifamilies. We have plenty of um, units that are multi-units like with ADUs, granny units, or junior accessory dwelling units. So I'm not unfamiliar with that type of management, but it is still gonna be a big difference and the lending is gonna be different. We are pretty much tapped out on our ability to get loans because we've eliminated Jake's W-2 payroll. And so our debt to income ratio is not favorable anymore. So now I'll be looking at seller finance or creative finance. You guys might've heard of Pace Morby. He is a super guru about um, creative finance, seller finance type stuff. So I'm considering joining his community um, at a very pricey price point, but I think it would be worth it if it could get us to that deal faster and future deals in the future, learning how to do that strategically. One of the key factors that I want to make sure I uh, accomplish in this next step is that the return on investment has to be higher than what it was before. So I'm looking for an ROI of at least 20% up to 30% is my range. And that would be sufficient to make me feel like I did a good job moving the money over. If there's a way that I can split that 200 up into investing in the multifamily, um, as well as investing in an upgrade for our own personal residence, that would be an ideal situation for me. All right, you guys, we've come to the end of the video and I'm gonna share with you this super amazing loophole that I found on how to bypass the California state withholding. So this might not apply to you in your state, but if you have something similar, then this could at least 
get you started and looking in the right direction if it's something that's possible for you. There is this form that I'm gonna show you here and I'm also going to link down below and it allows you to bypass or be exempt from the California withholding of 3.33% of the gross um, sales number if you meet certain criteria, and one of the criteria is if the home is owned by an LLC now at this time our home was actually in, in our individual names it was not in our LLC's name the reason why we did that was because we purchased it before we got married and all the legal paperwork weren't in line yet so it was a work in progress if we had kept the property eventually we would have moved it over but we hadn't at this point so I asked my my title person and I said hey can I use this form and she was a little reluctant at first because she, what they she didn't want is for me to be a frivolous seller and try to get around the withholding but then at the end of the year couldn't pay that money back and what I reassured her was that we already have done cost segregations we have a lot of write-offs and depreciations and deductions to where we won't even owe this amount at the end of the year and so I don't want the state to take it now and um, then we have to lose months and months like three quarters of the year or something like that to not have this amount of money be working for us in a high yield savings account or wherever we chose to put it so after I reassured her she was like okay all right let's go ahead and do that I can do that for you free of charge she was able to help us re work the title to put the house into our LLC's name through this transaction and got it notarized and then we filled out that form and then we were able to be exempt and poof just like that we didn't have to give up that $30,000 for the better half of the year anyway if you guys found any of this helpful at all would you consider subscribing and liking this video I also want you to comment down below with any further questions that you have about the scenario or any other video ideas that you want me to make for you guys because this is what I'm doing now I'm on YouTube for you all right you guys have a good one and I'll see you next week bye